So hello everyone, welcome. Uh, good uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the the place in the world you are. Welcome to the uh, 2023 OTS uh, webinar series. So today we will have uh, the very first uh, uh, webinar of the OTS 2022 poster winners. Um, so uh, we sent a message to all the poster winners and we gave them the opportunity to present uh, the data from their poster uh, during this uh, webinar series. So I think it's a, it's a very nice opportunity for, uh, for young people uh, to present and have uh, a, a nice and dedicated uh, audience. So today I am hosting uh, the webinar together with uh, Leonora. Uh, which you might know as he's a former uh, junior board of directors member from the from the OTS. Uh, and today we have uh, two speakers. So our very first speaker is uh, Nefeli. And uh, well, Nefeli, just uh, I think it's uh, it's okay if you introduce yourself and introduce your work. Uh, so uh, Nefeli, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to present at the OTS webinar. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Um, and yeah, my name is Nefeli. I am originally from Greece. I am a fourth year graduate student at Tufts University in the Kritzer Lab. Tufts is located in Boston. Um, and yeah, we're a bit outside of Boston, but we have a very nice overview of the city. And uh, I will be presenting to you my oligonucleotide based project. And the title is Quantitative Measurement of Cytosolic and Nuclear Penetration of Oligonucleotide Therapeutics and investigation of sequence penetration relationships. So one of the major limitations towards the development of more effective RNA therapeutics is the limited knowledge that we have about their cellular uptake. We know that RNA therapeutics enter the cells through endocytosis. They will initially be trapped by early endosomes, which will mature into late endosomes that will then fuse with the lysosomes where they will get degraded. This material is said to have undergone non-productive uptake because it will never manage to reach its target. A very small amount of material that remain trapped into the late endosomes will manage to escape and find its way into the cytosol and from there to the nucleus. This material is said to have undergone productive uptake because only this material will manage to find its target mRNA. It will be functionally active and essentially will provide the phenotype that it was designed for. The problem is that most of the current uptake assays cannot distinguish material that remain trapped into the endosomes from material that reached the cytosol or the nucleus. So in other words, most current uptake assays cannot distinguish productive from non-productive uptake, and instead they give us information about the total uptake. A very common strategy is to attach a fluorophore on the five prime or three prime ends of an RNA therapeutic and follow its path into the cells, um, either through fluorescence microscopy or flow cytometry. These methods are super informative and very helpful and useful, but they do have some um, disadvantages. For example, the attachment of a bulky and hydrophobic fluorophore most likely will, will interfere uh, with how the molecule and, uh, gets in cells and how it escapes the endosomes. And moreover, in cases of um, uh, degradation of the molecule, we're still monitoring and we're still quantifying fluorescence from the fluorophore through flow cytometry. And similarly, uh, material that remain trapped into the endosomes or into the plasma membrane is still being quantified uh, by flow cytometry, which results essentially in some false positive data. But in order to uh, develop more effective RNA therapeutics, our efforts should be into maximizing the productive uptake um, of the RNA therapeutics only. So for that, we need a NASA that can exclusively report on the productive uptake. And to address that, we have applied the chloralkane penetration assay, or CAPA for short, that was originally developed in our lab in 2018. CAPA has the advantage that it exclusively reports on the cytosol or the nucleus of cells. CAPA um, relies on an enzyme that is called halotag. And halotag is a halalkane dehalogenase that is modified so that it can covalently react with any chloralkane tagged uh, molecule. You can attach this halotag ligand to any molecule of interest, 
And now this molecule can be used um, for kappa. We use HeLa cells that stably express halo tag facing the cytosol. So we begin our experiment by pulsing the cells with serial dilutions of the chloralkin tagged oligonucleotide. And we incubate the cells at 24 for 24 hours at 37 degrees Celsius. If the molecule manages to enter the cells and if it manages to escape the endosomes, it will find its way into the cytosol where it will block uh, halo tag. It will react with it covalently. We will wash off any unbound material, and then we will chase the cells with a chloralkane tagged dye that will very readily get in cells and block any open halo tag spots. From these two first steps, you can see that the more cell penetrant the molecule is, the more halo tag spots will be blocked in this first step, and the fewer halo tag spots will be open for the dye to react with. In other words, the uh, extent of cell penetration a, and the efficiency of cell penetration is inversely proportional to the red fluorescence that we see in cells. So we then go ahead and uh, measure the difluorescence by benchtop flow cytometry, and we normalize our data based on controls. We have cells that are treated with only dye that represent 100% fluorescence, and cells that are treated with neither dye nor molecule, which represent 0% fluorescence or background. Our data end up looking like these sigmoidal curves. And we also derive um, a CP50, uh, which is a value, the, a value which uh, essentially means the concentration of the molecule at which 50% of halo tag in cells was blocked by the molecule of interest. And the smaller the CP50, the more cell penetrant the molecule is. So kappa is a high throughput assay, quite straightforward and cost effective. Um, and it was originally applied for peptides in our original publication. But we have now shown that we can reliably and reproducibly carry out kappa on modified oligonucleotides, both um, ASOs and siRNAs. So in our original experiments, in order to try to see whether we can apply this uh, for RNA therapeutics, we prepared six molecules, all having the base sequence of nucinersin, but with different chemical modifications, either a phosphodiester or phosphorothioated backbone, and sugars that were either deoxyribonucleotides or had a 2 primal methyl or 2 um, uh, along the whole sequence. And CDW is our small molecule control. It's just a tryptophan amino acid with a chloralkane tag uh, that we always use, uh, use on our plates as an internal control. And all these molecules were prepared uh, with a five prime chloralkane tag. Um, so then we were ready to actually carry out kappa experiments. We saw that the least modified RNA therapeutic, the, the least modified ASOs uh, seem to be the least cell penetrant molecules. The most cell penetrant of this panel seem to be the phosphorothioated version with two prime methyl sugar. Here you can see our kappa curves. And here's another way to represent the kappa data. We plot the percent occupied halo tag at a specific concentration for all the molecules. And here you see again that the more cell penetrant candidate uh, occupied the most amount of halo tag at five micromolar. We're also able to carry out kappa in the nucleus of cells. We do that by delivering the halo tag GFP uh, construct into the nucleus of uh, cells using AAVs, adeno-associated viruses. The construct will bind to histone 2B of uh, cells, and that's how we are able to uh, monitor kappa and cell penetrance in the nucleus. Here you see an experiment with uh, a panel of molecules, ASOs and siRNAs and our small molecule, carried out side by side in the stable uh, HeLa cell line that reports in the cytosol, and in the nucleus of HeLa cells where Halotech was delivered by AAV. And if you look closely at the CP50s uh, in cytosol versus nucleus, you will see that we don't um, observe huge differences between the two compartments. And this is most likely because the rate limiting step is um, getting away, escaping the endosomes. Once the molecule has found its way into the cytosol, it will pretty easily find its way into the nucleus as well. 
So that's why we um, resonate the fact that we don't see huge differences between the two compartments. We're also able to carry out kappa in different cell lines, potentially more therapeutically relevant uh, for the development of RNA therapeutics than um, HeLa. And here we chose to uh, carry out kappa with this panel of molecules uh, in the neuroblastoma SHSY5Y cell line. We were surprised to see quite big differences um, in the cell penetration efficiencies of these molecules between the cell lines. And for example, I'll just point out the PMO ASO that seemed to not be as cell penetrant in HeLa cells, but in the neuroblastoma cell line, it was tenfold, tenfold more cell penetrant, which was really interesting to see. Uh, and now we're in the process of um, doing this in a diverse panel of cell lines with diverse panel of molecules uh, to see what differences we will observe, if any. Um, so all these and more data are actually currently published in our ACS chemical bio biology paper from 2022. Um, and now I would like to move on to uh, our next application of kappa um, in order to investigate the sequence penetration relationships of ASOs. So once we established essentially that we can do kappa with modified um, RNA therapeutics, we wanted to see if we can answer some more questions about their cell penetration efficiencies. And we all know that uh, from literature, from the literature that chemical modifications affect the cell penetration efficiency of ASOs, but there is still not a concrete consensus about how ASO features such as their base composition, their base sequence and length affect their cytosolic penetration. And this is what we sought to um, answer again using Kappa. And the next few slides contain data that are currently submitted but not published yet. So we wanted to start by looking at the effect of base composition. We prepare, prepared nucinersen, this time with its actual chemical modifications, phosphorothioated backbone and uh, two prime methoxyethyl sugars, and its reverse complement uh, molecule, and again with the same chemical modifications. These two molecules have the same uh, length and same chemical modifications, but of course, different base composition. And when we did kappa for these two molecules, we saw a very significant difference among the CP50s of these two molecules, which most likely means that base composition plays an important role in the cytosolic penetration of ASOs. We then wanted to look at the effect of base sequence. So for that, we designed five scrambled versions of nucinersen. Now, these six molecules have the same length, same chemical modifications, same base composition, but different base sequence. So the only difference is where each base is placed along the 18-mer sequence. We carried out kappa, and we saw um, two, more than twofold differences between the CP50s of some of these molecules. We didn't expect huge differences to begin with, but even when we um, uh, plot the percent occupied halotag at a specific concentration, we see significant differences among the um, cell penetration efficiencies for these six molecules, which leads us to conclude that base sequence most likely affects uh, cytosolic penetration of ASOs. We then wanted to look at the effect of length. So for that, we designed molecules with um, a nucleotide uh, with a, a length ranging from 16 to 30 nucleotides. Again, the parent sequence was nucinersen, and we either removed or added nucleotides on the five and three prime ends of the nucinersen base sequence. So initially we hypothesized, we sort of expected a linear relationship between increasing length and um, decreasing cell penetration efficiency. So in other words, increasing length and increasing CP50. But that's not what we ended up seeing at all. Um, here I have plotted the CP50s for each of these molecules, and you can see that the 16-mer seemed to be slightly more cell penetrant than nucinersen, but then adding two bases, one at each um, end of uh, nucinersen resulted in a 20-mer that was really not cell penetrant, even at the five micromolar highest concentration that it was tested. However, adding more bases uh, resulted in molecules like the 22-mer, 24-mer, and 28-mer, 
which seem to be seem to be even more cell penetrant than nucinersin. The 26 mer was moderately um, cell penetrant, while the 30 mer once again was not cell penetrant. And here you can see again the dramatic differences uh, in cell penetration for these molecules. The third mer seemed to occupy zero to two percent halo tag at 1.67 micromolar, while the 22 mer and 24 mer at the same concentration seemed to occupy 70 to 75 percent halo tag. So that was very interesting but confusing at first. Um, but then we thought we should probably look at the secondary structure that these molecules um, are predicted to adopt because this is something that we didn't have control over when we designed these uh, molecules or we didn't think of controlling. And we use the UNA fold web server to predict the secondary structures. These are the lowest energy predicted structures um, that UNA fold web server predicted for uh, at 37 degrees Celsius. And I'm also plotting, I have also uh, indicated the CP50s for each of these molecules um, just for comparison purposes. And I would like you to uh, focus on the 20 mer, the 26 mer, and the 30 mer. These three molecules seem to have the highest, the longest stem um, in this herpin like structure that they are predicted to adopt. All the other molecules um, had much shorter stems, stem lengths. And these three molecules with the longest stems seem to be the least cell penetrant ones. The disadvantage with the UNA fold web server is that it does not take into account chemical modifications, which could affect how these molecules end up being structured uh, in reality. And it also doesn't take into account the uh, chloral kin tag that we have attached on the five prime end. So to account for that, we um, run all these molecules on agarose gels, on 4% agarose gels, and we stain them with ethidium bromide, an intercalator that can give us uh, information uh, about the secondary structure of these molecules, specifically the, how, how intense each band is and how far it travels along the gel can give us some information about the secondary structure that uh, this molecule adopts. And that's exactly what we did. We carried out this uh, gel, these gels um, three independent times, and we got some information about the band intensity and band mobility. So if we focus at the band intensity first, we'll see that uh, the intensity of the band is follows the same trend as the CP50s, which means that the more intense the band gets, the higher its CP50 is. So the more secondary structure that the molecule has, the least cell penetrant it is. Again, if we focus at the band mobility, we'll see that most of these um, oligos have a linear trend between increasing length and um, shorter distance traveled or higher distance from the front. And this is true for most of these, but again, the 20 mer, 26 mer, and 30 mer, the ones that seem to be the more intense bands and the ones that seem to be the least cell penetrant molecules, do not follow this trend. So all in all, the Kappa data in combination with the UNA fold web server predicted structures and the agarose gels, where we saw uh, we got some data about the band intensity and band mobility, led us to hypothesize that secondary structure most likely plays a very important role in the cell penetration of ASOs. And the last thing that we wanted to do is try to look at the effect of structure slightly more closely and to do that, we designed a scrambled version of nucinersen that we named Herpin. Um, and this molecule was intentionally designed to have high, a higher degree of secondary structure than nucinersen. These two molecules have the same uh, length, same chemical modifications, same base composition, but different base sequence, and here different um, secondary structures as it was predicted by the web server and as it was verified by agarose gels as well. We carried out kappa with the two molecules and we saw that the herpin was significantly less cell penetrant than nucinersen, which verified our hypothesis that secondary structure um, affects the cell penetration efficiency of ASOs. 
And you might be aware of this. Uh, there is uh, a predicted, uh, a proposed model for how phosphorethylated ASOS enter the cells by the Matil group in Switzerland, uh, which is the thiol mediated uptake model. Phosphorethylated ASOS are said to interact with the cell surface thiols and disulfides, and this is how they're taken up by the cells. And if this model is true, our data supported because we, sh we saw that oligonucleotides with low degree of secondary structure seem to be getting in the cells quite efficiently because most likely they have lots of phosphorethioates free to interact with the cell surface um, proteins uh, with their thiols and disulfides. Whereas oligos with higher degrees of secondary structure that have like this prominent herpin-like structures do not get in cells as efficiently. And this is most likely because they don't have as many phosphorethioates so they cannot interact with the cell surface proteins as efficiently. And to conclude, I hope I have persuaded you a little bit that Kappa is a useful tool for measuring the cytosolic and nuclear penetration of oligonucleotides. Base composition, base sequence, length, and secondary structure seem to affect the cell penetration of oligos uh, in a synergistic way, but uh, with secondary structure, probably having a very important factor um, in how cell, how ACEs are taken up by the cells. And low degree of secondary structure seems to correlate with improved penetration. And we're also able to carry out kappa in cell lines that are more therapeutically relevant than model cell lines. Thank you very, very much for your attention and again for the opportunity. Um, thank you very much to my PI and my wonderful lab members. I had great fun at the OTS and um, yeah, I'm a fourth year grad student, hopefully getting out uh, next spring. I would be more than happy to continue working in this amazing field that I've loved uh, so far. So thank you. And I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Nephili. That was a really well-rounded well -rounded study and uh, Congratulations to your team for developing that assay too. It seems really useful. So we have uh, lots of questions in the chat. Uh, I'll go through them. I think some of them uh, you you did tackle, but uh, just for so everyone can hear. Um, Jangir asked, how do you compare results across cell types given that the data is normalized within each cell type? I, so I guess that means how can we make sure that Halotag uh, the halotag amount is the same, I suppose, if I'm reading this correctly. Um, so we always gate for the uh, halotag expressing cells, and we make sure that the halotag expression is uniform from cell line to cell line. Uh, we do that by flow cytometry, and we only get data for the cells that we want, essentially. Okay, I think that does help with the, because you're kind of normalizing across exactly. the cell types at the beginning. Yeah. Um, OK, uh, Elena Feinstein asked, how do you distinguish metabolic instability from worse penetration in case of modified versus unmodified oligos? That's a very good question. And we did, um, uh, we this is in our minds a lot. Um, and I believe that um, comparing RNA therapeutics that are not modified in the same way, side to side, like an siRNA that has a cholesterol versus an siRNA that doesn't. I think it's a bit uh, risky in like making conclusions based only on kappa because we don't know if you know if there's degradation associated with one versus the other. So I think I like to be always cautious, and that's why I chose for my study to have everything modified the same exactly uh, in the same exact way, so I can make. Um, comparisons more easily head to head. Wait, what, uh, towards the end, you showed that, I think, with the um, with the Nusenersen sequence. Um, side side note, but I noticed that uh, in when you were testing all the different modifications like DNA, 2 prime methyl 2 prime MOE and stuff, um, did you consider testing just the RNA, like the hydroxy, or was that too unstable to kind of work with? Um, these were data carried out by my labman who has now graduated i Pretty think good. at the time so when they started doing that i think i don't i'm not sure if they had considered it but uh, i wouldn't be surprised if they didn't because of instability concerns yeah. 
Yep, fair enough. Uh, Elena also asked, did you compare cytosolic versus nuclear penetration for siRNAs? Yes, and this is, um, if you go to the ACS chemical bio um, publication, you can see lots of data there. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, Laura Scofano asked, how long were the oligonucleotides incubated for in cells? We do 24 hours. Um, and for siRNAs, we also do up to 48 hours. Uh, in the publication, again, there is a nice time course at like 2, 4, 12, and 24 and 48 hours. So you can see like a nice uh, time course carried out there as well. Okay. Um, this one, I think you, you mentioned briefly, but just to repeat, Vincent asked, uh, which tool was used for predicting secondary structures? It is, uh, it's called the UNA fold web server. Uh, if you okay. write that. Maybe, yeah, maybe later if you can answer it, um, in the chat. So people, I can put the link. Or, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> Cecilia asked, sorry, you got lots of questions. People are very intrigued. Oh, I see the, I see um, the question and I'm laughing. Good. Good. Uh, Cecilia asked, can you try Kappa in primary cultures such as primary fibroblasts? You definitely can. And I know this is something that Joshua, my PI, wants me to do soon. Uh, we mammalian cell, like um, cancer cell lines are definitely easier uh, to work with. I haven't worked with primary cells yet, but I definitely want to. And I definitely want to give it a try because it's going to be obviously more informative. Yeah. Um, got a chemistry question by Guohan. He asked, how does the chlorotag react with the oligos? So we order the oligos. We don't make them in house, but we order them with a five prime azide. Um, and then we have a chloralkane tag with um, a dibenzyl cyclooctane group. So it's a very quick click reaction. Um, definitely adds, um, you know, it's a linker. It's not a tag free assay. That's, I guess, the, the, the main disadvantage of Kappa, if I'm being completely honest. But again, all our molecules have the same tag, so it should still be a head-to-head -head, um, fair comparison. Okay, great. Uh, Annabelle said, really nice talk. ASOs have different intracellular protein binding depending on their sequence and chemistry. Does this difference in protein binding impact the interaction between the chloro-ASO and halotype protein? I would expect that it does. I don't think that the chloralkane will impact really the uh, interaction of the ASO itself with all the proteins that it's supposed to interact, um, if I'm reading the question correctly. Um, um, so I think it's still able to you know, function normally um, and still do what it's supposed to do in the cells, but the chloralkane is there uh, so that we can measure the cytosolic penetration. Right. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, Annabelle. Uh, Ronald, feel free to stop me if we need to move on to the next one, but I will continue checking off these uh, questions. Another question from uh, Gohan, what specific endocytic mechanism does these do these ASOs follow and what's the charge of the molecule? Uh, the endocytic mechanism that I'm aware, I, I don't know if it's like, clathrin mediated or something else. Um, I don't want to say something wrong here. Um, yeah, but also like if there are more questions or if I didn't answer something, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to continue the discussion. Yes, thank you. Time for one more question, Eleanor. Okay, one more. Let's see. And a very short uh, answer. Okay. Uh, you're trying to find a short question. Um, did you check the secondary structure changes uh, of the ASOs with different base compositions to see if the changes in penetrance were due to secondary structure instead of the, the base composition? Or, right, I think that's what that's asking. Um, so short answer, we did not um, check. Like the herpin-like molecule, for example, we didn't make it with other chemical modifications, no. Uh, to see if it's a combination of factors, if right. that's what this is asking. But yeah, so. again, I wanted to have the same chemical modifications in all my panel just to make, uh, you know, as clean conclusions as possible, I guess. Great. Okay, well, we'll stop there with the questions. Thank you so much again, Nephili, and uh, feel free to keep the conversations going in the Q&A. Um, but other than that, we'll move on. Thanks. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Nefli, for presenting uh, these uh, excellent data. So, uh, indeed, uh, when you still have uh, questions for Nefli, please use the Q and A function, uh, and she will be answering the questions in the in the Q and A. So, uh, time to move to the second speaker of today. That's uh, Marlene Laufer from the, uh, the Dutch Center of RNA Therapeutics at the LMC in Leiden, the Netherlands. There's Ronald, this. I think you have to give my camera <laughs> away because I'm not allowed to show my video anymore. <laughs> um, let's see if I can. Yes. Ah, oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. No, I'm, all good. All sorry. good. Uh, great. So, uh, well, yeah. The floor is yours and uh, ready to go. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, Ronald already introduced me. So I, I work also in LIDA as, as Ronald does. And uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to speak today. And I work at uh, the Dutch Center for RNA Therapeutics, where we look into developing personalized treatments for patients with really rare diseases using antisense oligonucleotides. So I think something very, very different to the previous talk. And I'm still thinking about how can I use uh, the knowledge I just gained for my own uh, treatments that we are developing. I, I would like to go back and start, how did this field develop? And where do we come from having these um, N of one therapies using antisense oligonucleotides? And the background is that there's many patients suffering from rare diseases worldwide. So there's um, roughly 6% of the world's population that has a rare disease, and we have over 7,000 rare diseases. And the problem is that for over 90% of these diseases, no treatments are available or just clinical management and care of the symptoms. And many people are trying to find new targets and new treatments for these rare diseases, and one option is antisense oligonucleotides and really focusing on a single patient at a time, making a tailored therapy. And I would like to go back to the patient zero, so to say. So this is Mila. And Mila and her family together with Team U in Boston were the first ones who developed such a personalized treatment. And what was so remarkable about the whole process is that within one and a half to two years from diagnosing, finding the genetic cause of Mila's disease to treatment, um, going through the whole process of getting the patient cells, making the antisense oligonucleotides, testing them on the patient cells, doing a screening in rats, and then actually treating the patient. And she was the first one, and she kind of started this whole field and inspired many, many people. And so the Dutch Center for RNA Therapeutics was founded on Rare Disease Day in 2020. So we are just about three years old. And this is a consortium made up of three um, university medical centers in the Netherlands with expertise on antisense oligonucleotides, on um, neurodegenerative diseases, on retinal diseases, and on neurodevelopmental disorders. And based on that expertise, you already see where the focus is. So we are trying to make uh, tailor-made uh, therapeutics for patients with nano rare mutations of uh, the brain and the eye. So that is basically the focus we are having. And we are not the only ones um, that are doing this and also not the only ones in, in Europe or in the world. So we have the Dutch Center of RNA Therapeutics in the Netherlands. And then in Europe, we have what is called one mutation, one medicine, basically the same idea. You have one mutation, you make one compound for a patient. And then globally, there is the N of one collaborative, which is a combination of everyone involved in this N of one field. So we do have chemists, we do have clinicians and different researchers. We have patients and patient organizations involved and also many other stakeholders that are communicating with the FDA and EMA to try and get these uh, very rare patients the therapies they are needing. And one of the things we are looking into, or one of the the questions we have to solve, how can we identify the patients that are most likely to benefit from such N of one treatments without treating the ones that are not going to benefit? Because every therapy development takes roughly two years. There's um, lots of costs involved, but also lots of hopes you're working with when you talk to the patients. So we want to try to identify which are the patients that are most likely uh, to benefit from receiving such a therapy. So what you have to look into then is, which are the diseases that are going to be treatable with these um, personalized antisense oligonucleotides? Which tissues can you safely target? Which symptoms are there that you can really mitigate? And what the genetic variants have to look like 
that we can modify them. And to answer some of these questions, so of course we are looking into patients that are really, really rare, so ideally unique, so that's why we call it N of 1 cases. The diseases we are looking into should predominantly affect the central nervous system. This is what we are focusing on here at the DCRT, but we do know that, of course, other um, companies or, or other groups are looking into targeting other tissues. And we would like to have something that is progressive or where we can measure a clinical benefit. So we are not looking into measuring biomarkers or secondary outcomes. So we're really looking into finding a way together with the patient, the family, and the clinicians to identify treatment goals that could be reducing the amount of seizures or limiting the, the time or the duration of a seizure, um, slowing down the progression if someone is going to lose their ambulation, slowing down that they become wheelchair bound. So kind of things we can measure that can benefit the quality of life of a patient. And we started with focusing on the central nervous system because we do have approved antisense oligonucleotides that are um, targeting the central nervous system. But what we can also have here, we can have a local treatment, we can give a low dose, but we get a high local expo exposure and we have a low systemic exposure. So minimizing any kind of side effects that we would get. And also the added advantage here is we have a low treatment frequency. So if you treat um, the brain and the spinal cord, you can give intrathecal injections. So that's into the spine. Um, and there you have treatment frequencies of three to four months. And if you want to treat a retinal disease, so you can really directly inject into the eye and that you can do um, twice a year. So there we have these factors that we're working with at the moment. And one of the things we looked into is like, okay, which of the genes that are affecting the central nervous system are eligible? So I talked a little bit about what the disease phenotype should look like. It should be progressive or you should have something that you can measure as the seizures or loss of ambulation over time or loss of vision. So what we did, uh, we took all the genes that are associated with um, inherited diseases of the central nervous system. There's over 4,000. Um, genes associated with these kind of rare diseases. And we really go manually at the moment, step by step through all those genes. Um, I have evaluated over 900 right now, where we look, okay, does the phenotype of these patients that is described in the literature, of course, that can um, be biased depending on what has been published, but does this phenotype of these patients that have been described in the literature match something we could um, ameliorate with an antisense oligonucleotides? And then we start ranking these diseases of which are most eligible, which are likely eligible, or which are unlikely eligible. That was one of the first things um, we started doing. And then looking into the therapies we are using. So we are working with splice modulating antisense oligonucleotides. So I'm just popping this up again. Uh, we're going from the DNA into the pre um, mRNA through transcription. And then you have the splicing um, apparatus going into the mRNA. And then you have the translation into the protein. So we are looking into that splicing mechanism where we target um, our patients. And this, of course, matters of how we are going to develop later our antisense oligonucleotides, but it also matters of which kind of patients, which of kind of diseases and which kind of variants can we target. And uh, this has luckily already been explained. So we're working with the backbone, so the chemistry of nucinersin, because this is FDA and EMA approved. And nucinersin, over 12,000 patients worldwide have been receiving this drug already. So we know that the backbones should be safe and reliable. And the only thing we're doing is we're changing the sequence of the antisense oligonucleotide matching the patient's mutation. So what are the mutations that we can target or that we can look into? Because we are looking into splicing, um, splice modulating antisense oligonucleotides, there's um, certain variants we can look into. So for exonic variants, we can look into variants that are changing the frame shift so that we could cause an early stop and then truncating a protein um, or that could just change um, the, the transcript and causing a frame shift this way. And what you normally then get is 
no protein expression at all. But if this is in an exon that you can skip, so you can um, kind of mask it from the splice apparatus, uh, you could then get a normal mRNA, but that's truncated. So it's not the canonical version anymore, but it's an mRNA that can be translated into a protein, which would be truncated. And in these cases, you could still get a partially functioning protein, depending on what domains are in these exons that you mask from the splice apparatus. The other thing that you can be doing is looking into toxic gain of function variants. So these are often variants that we call missense variants, where we change an amino acid and then all of a sudden there is an extra function to a certain protein. Also, what you could do here, you can take out um, that exon that contains this variant if you create later on an, an in-frame transcript. And this way you would also get a truncated protein with potentially leftover function. So these are hard to target because you have to really make sure that you can take out the exon, that you can skip the exon, and that also the protein you're creating is still functioning. And you would have to do lots and lots of essays later on to really show that you can change the patient's phenotype with these truncated proteins. So the variants that are actually ideally suited for these type of therapies, and that is also what has happened to the first patient. So Mila, she had a deep entronic variant that was causing a so-called cryptic splicite or activating a cryptic splicite. So these are splicites that are normally not used in the splicing process, but through a mutation, at that point or around that point, it can happen that the splice site then gets activated. And what happens is um, this is basically being recognized as a splice site. So the, the machinery thinks it's an exon and it integrates part of the intron into the transcript. So what should we then call a cryptic exon? And of course, this is again causing a frame shift. And then later on, you would not get a protein that is being expressed. Here we can use the antisense oligonucleotides to really mask that variant completely so it can't be recognized and you would get the normal physiological mRNA transcript and then you have the full protein expression. So these are the ideal candidates. The problem is that in clinical genetics nowadays, we're mostly doing what we call whole exome sequencing. So we are only looking into the coding regions of every gene and we are completely missing the introns. So we kind can't find these variants at the moment, and they're only found in specific cases where someone then looks into the whole genome or where someone is suspicious that there might be a deep entronic variant and specifically looks into the introns of a gene of interest. But at the moment, we rarely find them. However, it is thought that 10 to 15% of the variants that are pathogenic are actually causing changes in splicing. So what we then did, um, what we wanted to do is try to find kind of rules, a set of rules um, that are easy to follow to identify which variants are eligible for the exon skipping therapies. And we went for, of course, the, the deep entronic ones or so the ones that change splicing. And we also went for the exonic ones, as I explained, the nonsense variants or the missense variants that are causing gain of function. And I'm not going to go into details, but I made uh, these decision trees that are helping us to go through step by step and to also make this a an standardized and optimized process to really not be biased and go through the same steps every time. Doing this manually takes two to three hours per patient. So that's quite uh, time consuming and labor intensive. But since this is just a decision tree, we thought, well, maybe we can make this into an algorithm and we can be faster with evaluating the patients or especially the variants. So can we, can we automate the process? And uh, the answer is it's possible. Um, and we are working on it at the moment. So there's two tools that are being developed. We have what is called the Exxon Chap app at the Dutch Center for RNA Therapeutics here in Leiden. And then uh, with our collaborators in Boston, Tim Uslep, they're working on something which is called the Splice Check app. And to just distinguish it, so Exxon Check is looking really in everything that is Exxon skipping related and Splice Check, as the name already says, is looking in all the splice altering variants. And the true heroes of this story are actually 
two of our students, so Iris Houting and Sofmia Kumar, two master students who are bioinformaticians who have taken on this project together with me and the rest of the team and looked into how can we automate the process? What are the steps that a little tool, a little algorithm has to take to give us the answer whether a variant is a good candidate for exon skipping therapy or not? And what we came up with is um, now a little tool that is running internally and is, we, we actually use it every day by now and we want to make it publicly available for everyone. So you can input a single variant of a patient or you can input a list of variants if you get uh, from colleagues from clinical genetics, a list of variants, you can input them and you can input them in different formats. So on transcript level, on genomic level, or you can input it on protein level. Um, and then the tool will give you all the information that you need to know to decide whether a variant is a good candidate for an exome skipping therapy or not. So what it looks like is, of course, it just gives you all the information on the variant at at the beginning, um, often what we see in the reports from clinical genetics, there might be mistakes or there might be mi mix ups with the transcripts they are using, which actually changes in the end which exon you would be skipping. So, this is something we have to check for. So, we look into everything. And it also gives you the gene the variant is coming from, and it is linked to our gene list. So, it actually tells you where in the ranking of the eligibility is this. So, this is a gene called WDR45 and it makes a neurodegenerative disease. So it has a priority of one being the highest priority as it is a very eligible gene for antisense oligonucleotide therapies. And um, after giving you all the information on the variant, it um, basically artificially skips the variant for you. So it will tell you where in the uh, transcript it is. So is it in the coding region? And is it the first or the last coding axon? Because then you can't skip it. But if it's in the middle, that's great. It will tell you how big the axon is that contains the variant. If we have axons that are getting too large, it's unlikely that, are, that they are skippable. It will tell you how close it is to the splice site, because if a variant is already at the splice site, most likely it is already causing a splice defect. And then it will tell you if the axon is in frame or out of frame, which is important for you to know whether when you take out the axon, will you get an in frame or an out of frame transcript. And then the last thing um, this is doing at this part is it takes the coordinates of the exon that the variant contains and it takes it out of the transcript and tells you what happens to the transcript and the protein sequence afterwards. So here you just see you get a deletion of part of the protein, but you don't cause, for example, an early stop and you don't cause a frame shift that would then lead you to a truncated protein. So it does that, so to say, artificially. And then for us to evaluate, is it even possible to skip a certain exon? And then it will also tell you which domains are in or around the area of that exon that you're planning to skip. Because if it's an important domain, it might be the, the functioning domain or the central part, or like the active center of your protein, then of course, that would not be an exon that you want to take out. And then of this patient would not be eligible. And then the last thing, it also checks where um, that gene is expressed. So we are, of course, try to get easily obtainable tissue from a patient that would maybe be fibroblasts or skin biopsy or blood cells. So we check if the gene that we are looking into is expressed in these cells, because then it would be easier for us to develop a therapy. And what it also looks is into all the databases to tell us if there's other patients that have been identified with this variant. And this is important for us in Europe specifically, because with these N of 1 cases, we are really only allowed to treat a single patient, that's a so-called named patient setting. And if we were to know that there's lots of patients available with this disease or with this certain mutation, we are not allowed to start treating. So that's why we have that integrated into our tool as well. And as I said, this is running internally. And instead of taking it two to three hours for, per patient now, it takes me two to two, three minutes to make a decision on a single patient. And the next step we are going to try to develop is um, a bit of a more elaborate tool. And the idea is to have it integrated into the diagnostic process 
directly. So it will be running into the clinical genetics departments in the labs there to directly filter every pathogenic variant that is being identified, run it through the tool and tell the clinicians if this is a good candidate or not, so that they can immediately um, notify us because what happens at the moment is that it takes sometimes months to years for a patient to really get referred to us and get looked into whether that could be a case um, for the antisense oligonucleotide therapies. Of course, they are just emerging, so that's why they, many people don't know about them yet, but we want to have um, this immediate reaction that people know about these, these possibilities and can inform their patients as well. Um, yeah, and then what you have with the tool, you can save all the variants that you have, and you can later also print them out if you wanted it, and you can also go back to the variants you already searched, so you don't have to redo that every time, and you basically have a database of everything you have been looking into. And the last thing I wanted to mention is, um, I talked about this earlier, that we can't identify these patients with these deep intronic variants that are causing cryptic splicing, which are ideally the candidates you would want to have for these personalized therapies. So we are trying to find ways to identify these patients better. So what we look are in undiagnosed cases of patients that have a clear phenotype of a disease, but nothing has been found in the exome. So then there should be something in the gene that makes that phenotype. If it's not in the exome, then potentially in the introns. Um, it can also be patients that have a clear phenotype of an autosomal recessive disorder. That means you should have two mutations um, and not just one. And if you only identify one mutation in the exons, it might be that the second mutation is in the introns. And what you can do then, you can do diagnostic RNA sequencing of these patients, ideally nowadays done from fibroblasts. The problem is that fibroblasts don't express all the genes that are relevant to the central nervous system. So we are missing roughly 30% of all the genes. And that means even if there was an a mutation that is causing any changes in splicing, we would not be able to see it from the RNA-seq and we don't see it from the whole exome sequencing. So there's new possibilities to change that and to do something about it. And one way uh, we are trying to do that here at the Dutch Center of RNA Therapeutics is that we have these fibroblasts from the patients and we force these cells to become all the cells of our interest. So cells of the central nervous system, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, neurons. And you can do this by a process called transdifferentiation, where you use a lentiviral vector that is expressing certain genes that drive the maturation um, of the cell types that you're interested in. And if you then use an inducible system, for example, using doxycycline inducible systems, you can put those genes into your fibroblasts. And then by adding doxycycline, you can turn on these genes and you force them to become the cell type of your interest. And from these, you can then take the RNA sequencing data and you will be able to identify the variants of these 30% of genes that are being missed in the fibroblasts at the moment. And we hope this way to get more patients, first of all, a diagnosis because they have lots of time spent uh, getting diagnosed and often we can't find a diagnosis. So we hope to find them a diagnosis. And then of course, if there are cases with these deep intronic variants that are causing splice alteration, then take them on here in Europe to try and develop um, personalized therapies for these patients. Um, with this, I would like to conclude and I would like to thank, first of all, Iris and Sofmia, who've been doing the programming on our Exxon Check tool. I would like to thank all the other people that have been involved in developing um, the whole guidelines and systems for us to be able to select these N of 1 cases. And then, of course, I would like to thank um, our whole team here um, in, in Leiden and the groups that are associated with our team and who've been helping a lot with making all of this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlon. I'm always impressed by how much you guys are doing at the, the DCRT. Um, and it's remarkable how much time you're saving with the automated process. Uh, I wanna start with a question that's kind of more for learning because uh, safe to say I'm not a biologist. So the deep intrinsic splice variants were new to me. Yeah. Um, like the cryptic exon, for example, do we have any insight into how these are recognized and incorporated into the mRNA or is this that still kind of yeah, I think there's multiple layers to that question. Yeah, good question. So what we do have is that 
splicing is not 100%, right? So even though we know where an exon starts and exon ends, um, when we look at the transcript, that's not what is happening in the cell. So there's lots of background splicing going on. There's lots of splice sites within the intron that are just not strong splice sites that are being recognized, let's say 10 to 20% of the cases. And what happens now, if you have a mutation deep intronically, it could be that it changes the way the splice site is recognized. And instead of now being recognized 10 or 15% of the time, it's being recognized 80%, 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. And it's being recognized as an actual splice site of an exon. And that's why then the splice apparatus thinks that's the splice site to go for and starts integrating these, these parts of the, of the intron into your transcript, making them a cryptic exon. That was really interesting to hear about. Thank you. I'm going to jump to the Q&A. Uh, Lena asked, is it possible to check for single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, for a certain gene? Yeah, I mean, you can put in everything. So we can check any, any variant that you want. Um, we will make it available. Some of it is available, but the tool that's currently publicly available on GitHub is a bit buggy. So email me with any variants you have. And once we have the bugs fixed, I'm happy to send out the code as well. Great. Um, Johan asks, does the automated process need any type of variant validation to address patient to patient differences or are the algorithms aimed to a majority of patients? So the algorithm is completely neutral and unbiased in that sense that it really just checks where is the variant located and is the exon that the variant is located in skippable or not. So you could also have multiple patients within the same exon, but not having the same variant, but variants next to each other. So it would always give you the same output at that point. Okay. And Sylvia asked, how do you know that a mutation is a pathological variant? Yeah, that's a very good question. So what we do at the moment, these are the variants we get referred to by the clinicians, so by the clinical genetic departments or medical genetic departments. So we do assume that these are the pathogenic variants. Um, the new tool we are building right now will integrate some checks whether the variant is indeed pathogenic. So there's lots of prediction tools. And the other thing, of course, is if it's a variant that has been recognized multiple times, it will be in the literature and marked as being a pathogenic variant. Okay, and a follow-up from Sylvia was, uh, are these resources open to researchers to run variants of non-neurological diseases? Yes, um, the, the tool also is completely unbiased in terms of whatever disease you have. So we focus on the neurological diseases, but the tool can be used for any kind of variant in any gene with any disease. And the new tool we are building will actually be using also any type of species. So then if you want to use exon skipping in a mouse, in a fly, in a worm, you would be able to use that as well. Great. Okay, thank you so much, Marlon. That wraps up the, the questions. Ronald, if there's anything else uh, from your end, um, let us know. Yeah, I would have a question uh, for my lady. Yeah. Nice <laughs> these kinds of things. So I think we discussed it before, but it might, might be nice to hear your opinion about this. So I think, uh, because it goes two ways, right? I think for at the moment, you don't have that many patients that are eligible yeah. for RNA therapeutics. So um, th that might be, you know, it, it might be very difficult to, to, to find good patients to be treatable. On the other hand, uh, once this, you have the uh, uh, this uh, script automated and you have a lot of uh, 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 physicians who uh, send the patients or the, the variants to you, then it might be a lot of patients that are eligible for RNA therapeutics. So, so how do you see this? Because of what I know here from the at the Leiden University Medical Center, it's already qu quite challenging when you have a clinical trial with a few patients, let's say five patients, that, that that's all they can do within within the clinic here. So, so how do you see this? And is it like any infrastructure changes? Are these needed? Yeah, Ronald, I, I mean, we've been discussing this. I, I love these questions because uh, this is exactly looking into the future. So at the moment, Ronald is very right. It's really hard to identify these patients or to find these patients. And that is at the moment mostly based because it's limited in the way we do our genomics analysis and the diagnostics in general. So I think with the new tools coming up, more and more people are doing RNA-seq routinely, more and more clinics and centers are using genome sequencing. So they will be able to identify more of these patients. As I said, the estimate is 10 to 15% of the variants are causing some kind of splicing. If all of them are eligible, of course, it's a different question, but there will be more. 
So um, at the moment, we are a little bit ahead of what we can offer to what is being delivered, and then there will be the switch. We have not figured out yet how to do this. And I think, of course, if that happens, we will be very selective and the costs that are involved are also going to explode, right? For every patient, there's a lot of money here in the Netherlands. Um, it will be funded through different systems, but this is something to think about. And I'm afraid I can't answer what is going to happen once we have a lot of patients to, to take care of. So, so any rough estimation how many patients are eligible for these kind of therapy? This is also a very good question. And we actually try to answer this with the new tool. So what we are building now, we want to run all the databases. So there's basis, databases with all the pathogenic variants that have been reported. They are called like ClinVar or LOVD. So we want to run all the variants through the tool to get an estimate how many patients or how many variants can be eligible. But at the moment, we can't say. Super. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marlene, and also uh, Nevely for uh, presenting uh, your data. I think uh, there was uh, two excellent uh, talks, and I really enjoyed them, and uh, I learned a lot uh, during this uh, uh, webinar, so uh, thanks a lot. So for the young people, I would like to say, um, for this year, uh, there are a still a few open spots, so if you like to present your data uh, during the OTS webinar series, uh, please contact us at the OTS uh, email address. Uh, and then the, I think the last uh, remark that I have is uh, in two weeks from now, we have uh, two presentations from the new junior board of directors. So it's uh, Gideon Belgrad and Crystal Johnson. So they will present their vision on the OTS and probably also some, uh, some data. And in four weeks from now, we have uh, Masad Dama and he will present a historical overview of uh, ASO synthesis. So I think, uh, two very uh, uh, cool webinars coming up in, in February. So uh, thank you for joining uh, today and see you all in, uh, in two weeks. Have a nice day. Thanks, everyone.